Welcome to Bloomberg Business Week Talks. Uh, today we are addressing a big question on everyone's mind as restaurants are reopening across the country. How will they change? I'm Kate Crater. I am food editor at Bloomberg Pursuits and write about food and restaurants and chronicle chefs. Um, and boy, do I miss restaurants. Hi, my name is Howard Joy. You I'm the deputy editor of Business Week. Uh, I, uh, I miss restaurants a lot, too. I don't like cooking at home. Uh, and uh, uh, Kate is the big restaurant expert. I just follow in her footsteps. Uh, ah. Our guests today are a whole bunch of uh, wonderful restaurateurs, ranging from uh, our first two, uh, uh, Moon Lin Tai, who runs as the co owner of uh, Kopitiam in downtown uh, Manhattan. Uh, it's a wonderful Malaysian restaurant uh, and coffee shop. Kopitiam means a coffee shop in, 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 the, in the local dialect. And our other guest is uh, Kwame Onwachi, who is one of the most acclaimed young chefs of the last year, uh, the author of his brilliant book and the chef of a brilliant restaurant in Washington, DC. I am so pleased to introduce two chefs and restaurateurs who really don't every, they are world famous. Marcus Samuelson, who has done everything from run one of the great acclaimed restaurants, Aquavit. Now he has Red Rooster and a host of other places. And he, besides running his great restaurant, he has been one of the great boosters of Harlem. He has, he brought the tide up with him. And now he has, now he's working in Newark um, with a grant from um, Audible. He'll tell you more about that. And then Daniel Balud, who is indeed one of the world famous chefs, one name only, Danielle. His flagship is Restaurant Danielle. He's getting ready to open it on the 22nd. Actually, he's getting ready to open his West Side Concepts Cafe Balud. And he's also been doing fantastic work with Food First, feeding over 100,000 first responders. Um, so he's been very busy. And now we'll let them, now we'll let them talk. Oh wait, we're a little bit of housekeeping first. Uh, there's all you can also ask your own questions as you're watching this. There's a question window on the right side of your webcast console. If you're watching on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube, you can add the questions in the uh, in comments. Please send them over as we'll be talking, and we'll keep asking them as we as we get a chance. Uh, then you can take it away. Awesome. Hi, I'm Moon Lin. I'm the co-owner operator along with Chef Kyo Peng of Kopi Tiam in Chinatown Lower East Side. And independently from Kopi Tiam, my romantic partner Yin and I, we started a supper club called Heart of Dinner back in 2015. And during COVID, we transitioned Heart of Dinner into a emergency relief efforts for to feed seniors in the five boroughs. So every Wednesday we feed upwards to fourteen hundred seniors. And that's <laughs> Hey, my name is Kwame Onwachi, um, born and raised in the Bronx, New York, uh, was raised in Harlem as well. I have a restaurant called uh, Kith and Kin in Washington, D.C., and recently um, penned a book called Notes from a Young Black Chef, which uh, chronicled my life story um, coming up in an industry that I think everyone here loves and it's close to our hearts. Um, you know, during this pandemic, uh, I really... It was a, a, a roller coaster of emotions for me. I know we we're supposed to be these stoic figures, um, but every day wasn't a, a great day for me, you know? And I had to remind myself that that's my mantra every day. But um, some days I had to let myself be sad and, and mourn the, the life that we once had here. Um, so I went back to the Bronx and, and helped out in my neighborhood. It was one of the hardest hit locations in the world. And um, we were able to feed some of the first responders there some of the community college students who are out of uh, school and they couldn't get a job anywhere. So yeah, um, you know, it's really, really important that we look to our communities that raised us and provided us with this platform to do what we love. Marcus. Um, hey everybody, happy, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I mean, the pandemic really changed everything for all for all of us, right? And um, we turned Red Rooster into Community Kitchen um, pretty early, the first week of March. We partnered with World Central Kitchen with Jose Andres' organization. 
And uh, just today, actually, yesterday, we, we crossed the 100,000 mark of people that we fed. We've done it in three locations, in Newark, Miami, and in, in Harlem. And um, I think we, it's a very inspiring time, right? We're going through the pandemic, but we're also going through American history right in front of us. So it's challenging and difficult, but I also think that uh, America is changing and hospitality is a huge part of that. And um, I, I see a lot of good changes that happen in the country. So I'm, I'm excited and cautiously optimistic. <laughs> Danielle? Yeah. Hello, I'm uh, Daniel Boulou, and uh, I've been a New Yorker since 1982, and uh, basically in the same zip code since. And uh, I, um, like everyone else, close all my restaurants and follow our staff. And right away, I created a foundation to be able to support the one who were the most in need and in our chief. Uh, following that. Uh, with my partner in the next project I have in New York at One Vanderbilt, um, he created a foundation called Food First Foundation. And right away, we worked like Marcus on World Central Kitchen and prepared meals for the first responder and hospital here around town. And then the idea of that was that as a landlord, he wanted his tenant we were in the food business to be able to reopen their kitchen and have some business. So he really wanted them to cook and he will offer those meals all over town. And so of course, City Meal on Wheel. Right now I'm cooking with City Meal on Wheel a lot. And we have uh, also done for many other charity in the five uh, boroughs of uh, New York City. And like Marcus, we take our responsibility as much as possible to our community and, and Uh -oh. I think uh, something's happened to Daniel's audio. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, sorry about that, Daniel. Uh, uh, but we'll move on to the, uh, as we, uh, we sort of promised before we got on it, I would ask the lightning round question. So no one, no one wanted to take me up on what it might be, but I will just pop it <laughs> now. Uh, so uh, the last few months, as difficult as they were, are very heartening because uh, it was all about trying to, to help the community, help people in need. Uh, but uh, but you're all in, at heart basically business people as well, uh, because restaurants are a business as well as, a, as 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 they can be an art form. So uh, what would you have if you if you're not knowing what you know now? What would you have bought or invested in? Uh, five months ago, that you would that that, uh, that that what would you have done five months ago if you knew it was going to happen? What would you have invested in, or bought, or or prepared for? <laughs> you know, that was going to happen. This is this is after all uh, a forum organized by business people. So we're this <laughs> uh, who wants to start? Uh, Melinda? Um, just something really trivial is I never knew the power of uh, self-adhesive shipping labels. And so when the <laughs> pandemic hit, most of our sales were moved towards retail. And so I was literally packing, writing every single one, and then like kind of waiting for the USPS to open, going to the back. But then after I got that printer and the self-shipping labels, it's been a quick one-stop shop. So <laughs> something small, but it saves so much time. <laughs> Mom, was there anything you want, you wish you had before all this hit? Oh, anything I wish I had before all of this. Um, we can. I'm, I'm gonna yeah, you come, come back on. to me. Lightning okay. round, Kwame. Lightning uh, round. All right. I uh, wish, I wish I had invested on a uh, place on the water so I could be during this time. <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh, that's what I wish I had. I mean, this doesn't really speak to an investment, but I guess it is an invertly investment. Um, I think the pandemic, more than anything, really threw the blanket off. And you look at real America, real systemic issues, right? 
So um, healthcare, I mean, everything that we do in America has to go through small businesses, but it doesn't. We actually have to I wish a government actually governed. They, they're supposed to govern, supposed to be smart government. And, you know, both Danielle and I, you know, coming, not saying that Europe did it so much better, but I'm saying there are structure they're here that are fundamentally wrong, right? We can't build a system in the middle of pandemic. So I wish there was a healthcare system that was just not down to the small businesses to deal with it during the pandemic. I wish that, you know, in Sweden, when I had to follow my staff, there, there was a work and unemployment system. So every person, including the employer, knew what would happen and people got their money. Here, you're building the system at the same time as you're trying to survive. And it's just chaos. And it's because of we have a government that doesn't want to govern. And I wish people uh, could vote and just um, create the change because it's completely chaotic. While you're being attacked, completely at the same time, build something. And during these last three months, America was held together by all the groups that have been marginalized. Immigrants, people that work on minimum wage, and uh, people that we normally uh, don't uh, look at as leaders in our society, and there have been nothing but leaders. And I hope the people in Washington, the, all the men that work on Black Lives Matter Plaza right now, I hope they're nervous because the change is coming. That's great. Uh, da da Danielle, is there yeah. anything, you know? Yes, uh, I'm, I'm back in, sorry. Okay, so is there, I don't know if you heard the question, <laughs> but very quickly, is there something that you wish you had invested in or bought now that you know that that there was going to be the five months of all of this? No, absolutely. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't think there is anything I could have thought uh, to prepare myself for this. I think uh, emotionally and, and it has been very hard for everyone, not only myself, but the entire team who worked with me and all that. So um, I think what I would like the wish is that at, uh, about a decade ago, I started to worry about education, but also in a way of teaching our craft to young people who cannot afford to go to a uh, school. And there is, a, there is an association called CCAP who have been doing an amazing job. And I was trying to create apprenticeship again, where we could pay those young kids to learn cooking and to be in, 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 in all over the kitchens of America. And, but we need the government to support them studying with us, and we can also pay them. And that will be the win-win situation where I think we can definitely enlarge the education uh, in our profession very much by teaching young people, and especially underprivileged, and also people where uh, we want to open our kitchen too, but it's more difficult when uh, there's no support from us, for us. Okay, you have a question? You have one question, right? I was gonna say, I feel very shallow because I would have said I would have invested in plexiglass and thermometers um, <laughs> on a very superficial level. Um, so, but now let's, um, we'll start our questions. Um, and Marcus, you talked about what an inspiring time this is. And in fact, you all have been doing really great work to support your communities. And how do you, do you, I would love to know from each of you, if you can keep that model going forward, even when the restaurants, whenever that great day might be, when your restaurants are operating, like Daniel Hume said, he can't imagine just feeding the 1% anymore. And I would love to know, how you guys can keep up the great work that you've been doing, even as you have to turn your focus back to running your restaurants and feeding grateful customers. Um, Kwame, I'm gonna start with you, please. Yeah, and I think it's integral that we think about how we can um, integrate the community um, into our restaurants. You know, uh, I think going back to the Bronx and feeding the community that raised me I don't think I've been more inspired um, in the last 10 years than doing that. Because when I put these, and it was with World Central Kitchen, when I put these World Central Kitchen plates into someone's hand, you know, this little uh, aluminum foil lined rectangle, they were just excited to get this food. It wasn't like, oh, the nuances of this curry, you know, I can taste all the notes, you know, <laughs> four stars, it wasn't like that. It was just like, thank you for this food. 
Um, and I think we, I've, I've also noticed how incredibly um, uh, streamlined that it can become because we have the tools and we have the skill set to feed large amounts of people. So if we can integrate that into our restaurants, um, I, th I think it's necessary. I think it's, it would be irresponsible not to do that. And, you know, whatever next restaurants I have, there's definitely going to be a community based um, effort that's built within the system. That's yay. Marcus, um, I know you've uh, you have been you've been great about um, supporting people even as you run your empire of restaurants. How do you see moving forward that you'll that you'll do this and talk if you can talk about Newark too? What you're doing in Newark, I think that's very yeah. inspiring. Well, I mean, first of all, we all belong to several communities, and that's very very important. We belong to the chef community, but we also belong to the neighborhoods that we're in, right? And for me. Who do I, the first question I asked me, who do I know, who can help me? And they are different in different places. So in Newark, it was Audible that stepped in and we partnered with Jose and World Central Kitchen. Uh, Michael B. Jordan, the actor, he's from Newark. So I had a chance to reach out to him and I knew he could amplify our effort, for example. And you know, the world restaurant means to restore your community. And that's kind of something that we all had to look at. What does it mean to be in this neighborhood? And as a chef, what is my role? And Danielle touched on it, right? Like CCAP, organizations like that, that in, empower youth. But then also as chefs, we know CEOs as well. So everybody from the dishwasher to the CEO who actually belong in this community where we can create something. So I think that this, this is gonna go a little bit in nuances and we're gonna go through a stage of mourning we're gonna, we've lost people in our industry. We're gonna get in, go through a stage of reflecting. How did we get here? And then we're gonna start planning because we are chefs and we are hardworking and we know we have platforms and all of those emotions are very, very, very important. And then we push out to our communities and create our new concept within the old restaurants or new restaurants and I do think the community feeding is nothing new for chef. Everyone on this panel have, are doing that or have done that. Uh, and but what form it will take, I think only the future will decide. On on that note, very um, one of our uh, we got a question early on from a, from one of our the people. Hopefully, is watching a name, uh, named Ian Sanderson who was talking about. What are the practical ways that you have nowadays, especially reaching out to the community? What have you learned so far, the best ways in the age of social distancing, that even though the community is there, how do you actually bring them in to feed them when you can't get actually that close? Uh, anyone wants to, to start out? Marcus, if, uh, from your restaurants, how are you doing that in terms of, of getting yeah. close to, I mean, physically, just, well, just the, the idea. Yeah, in the beginning, we had to listen to World Central Kitchen because they've done it before. And we came up with a system that obviously gloves and masks. But in the beginning, it was very hard to get gloves and masks. And we actually got them from our community. The street vendors in Harlem were very fast to create masks for us. <laughs> but then we have to set up guidelines of a line where the person came up and we asked, how many in your family, ma'am? She said five. We prepared, put our bag down, stepped away, and she stepped up. And this was all created because there was no guidelines. So we had to learn how do you serve while social distancing? And as awkward as that was, it was meaningful. So I think the first week was a little bit uh, challenging. Uh, and as our line changed, uh, new people came to the line and they didn't know, but then people are great, no matter what stage they are in their life, everyone in the line helped the new person know you're supposed to social distance. So I think I saw the best in people in the worst of times. Oh, that's great. And just so, just in case people are not aware of it, World Central Kitchen, which has been referred to several times as, as Jose Andres' organization that has been in the forefront of a lot of all the work feeding people at this time of crisis. Uh, we all know who Jose, who Jose is, but just in case our, our, uh, our listeners don't. Uh, anyone else want to say how they, they, they've gotten closer to their community in well, real practical terms in this time? 
Of course, and I think for me, uh, with City Milan Wheels, uh, of course, City Milan Wheels uh, basically served 18,000 meals over the five boroughs uh, before the uh, pandemic uh, every day. And as the pandemic came in, the, the goal of City Mill of just serving elderly became uh, much more uh, wider. And uh, their goal was to, I mean, they basically tripled the amount of meals they were asked for. And what made it possible, I think, was also the volunteering of so many amazing young people and uh, to, to give time. So I think they had up to 6,000 volunteers at one point who came to help City Mill in reaching out to the community and be, and also being very safe, but also being very efficient. And I think that's what we were looking for. Yeah. Well, then, I um, think I copy chat. Yeah. 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 Go ahead, uh, go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah. Let me start it. Um, good, good. Well, even before the pandemic, uh, community was a very integral part of Kopi Tiam. We started the Kopi Tiam Community Initiative about a year and a half ago, where every month we would find a different organization focusing on children, especially. Our team is 80% high school teenagers, and our kitchen is mainly single women above 60. So for us, it was so important to take very good care of both. And then being in this cross section of the Lower East Side, Chinatown, everyone comes in. You have, you know, the grandparents in their 80s, the new people that just moved into Lower East Side. So community has always been so important to us. And it's been so beautiful because these are the people that are coming back now supporting us 100%. I've been seeing the same guests walking by every single day, not only just to come by and order something from Kopitiam, but asking us, hey, are you too hungry? Are you too thirsty? Can I, here, I just brought the snack over for you. I'm not getting anything, but I want to make sure that you're okay. So I've never seen a more beautiful yeah. just transition. Yeah. And then also with Heart of Dinner separately, you know, people are driving from Queens to come pick up meals from my girlfriend and I and our restaurant partners and having so many different restaurant partners just in the area, just wanting to work together and supporting each other. It's been amazing. And so, just so grateful for everyone that's really stepped up during this time to help each other out. It's so important. Okay, Kwame. Yeah, and, and for us, it was really, um, you know, started with protecting our employees and the people that were working, right? So like we would only allow two people in the kitchen maximum uh, at a time. And it was a small, you know, 15 by 15 kitchen in, in the Bronx. And um, from there, we partnered also with Uber Eats so they were able to deliver the meals um, for free. So we would pack them up in the back of the trunk. The driver would stay in the front seat and he would ship it around the Bronx. And then whoever was picking it up would just open the trunk and take out their meals. So, um, so yeah, I mean, there's a lot of creative ways that we went about getting food to the communities um, and a lot of different organizations that helped us out throughout, along the way. Okay, you wanna ask we're, um, we're getting a lot of great questions in, so I'm gonna actually pivot and um, look at the future. <laughs> um, and so I'm gonna combine two questions. One is from Jason and one is from Ariel. And one is, and so the two part question is, if you were an existing um, semi-fine dining restaurant, or if you were to update your restaurant in the next 12 months, um, what what would you do? Like, what what are some of the things that you would do beyond the normal, like add space? And also, how do you see technology playing into your future plans? Do you, if what would you do to update that, or would you change anything? Um, Moonlin, I'm going to start yeah. with you on this one. We are a super casual restaurant, so I think now it's more so. We have a team. Everyone is part time. Everyone because actually they're all leaving soon because they're all graduating high school. Well, they were all supposed to graduate high school this year. Mm -hmm. So I think just going forward, kind of rescheduling, reformatting the menu, what is going forward, projecting out a couple months, what's gonna happen and just trying to stay on top of how things can change is very important. Um, 
technology <laughs> just at the base base level itself i've mm -hmm. never been on the computer or social media more than during this time and the technology and the internet at the store is terrible because when we first opened our office was in the <laughs> kitchen and it's all aluminum walls everywhere so we get no internet so just going forward transitioning more onto online sales trying to figure out how to ship our condiments um a lot of new projects that i've been really delayed on doing but i have to put that at the forefront now to Hope to survive. Uh, Danielle? Yes. Um, you know, I mean, I, how would you, if you, were, if you were, I think you are actually, I don't know if you can talk about it, but you, um, how would you um, renovate or how would you update your dining room um, going forward, let's say at Danielle or at Cafe Balloon? And um, and do you see any change in the technology that you're that you're going to be using? Well, uh, at um, I mean, I have the opportunity to have from fine dining to super casual with the retail store of Episerie Boulou. So each uh, each each restaurant will have to go through a different study of what we could really do to be in par with what the safety is and also what the law is and how our staff feel efficient and performant and how our customer feel also. I think at Danielle, I would like to maybe transform uh, the dining room into uh, a little bit of a different world for a short and the experience as well and forget whatever the restaurant started for, but to bring something fresh and uh, different and maybe more casual and more approachable uh and but that's a wish is it going to be a reality i hope i can make it and and uh, sort of sort of kind of do a pop-up inside its own self and then uh of course restaurant web terraces uh that's going to be helpful for the summer and we're going to put all the guidelines into the dining room as well but the the most important thing is the safety uh if we can really manage well the safety of our staff, I think we can manage well the safety of our customer. And so we are really taking a lot of steps for that in terms of uh, monitoring uh, every individual where, uh, you know, from the health point of view and making sure that they stay healthy and all that, to the, the, the protection they have to wear and the gears they have to have. But um, I believe that you know, fine dining or even a, a, a fine restaurant, it's something very nurturing for people as well. And if we are sensitive to uh, the customer, we need this evasion. Not everybody can travel the world and go and experience a great restaurant. So in their own city, they still want to have some great places. And um, I don't think my restaurant was made for the 1%. It was really already quite, we could see a lot of people from all over town, all over the country, all over the world coming. And I think we may not have that the same way, but we will make sure that we can bring the community, you know, take care of our community at the same time. Uh, or me or Marcus? Marcus, what are you thinking? Do you see some? Well, I, I think that, um, in the other industry in general, every 10 years we have to pivot. You know, 9-11 was a big pivot and that almost set up the pivot for casual restaurant. And uh, Danielle touches on it. We need all the type of restaurant in the industry because it's a great job, but also different skill levels. Like, I love fine dining and it's the most important school and aspiration platform and we need people to have the opportunity to work at some uh, a place like Danielle where the skills are unbelievable and because those are also schools you know like like a place like Danielle it's not just a restaurant for the customer it's also an aspirational platform for all of us and so it's a very very important part what what Danielle is doing but also the different type of restaurants right so but I look at what we are doing in Overtown for example we have the dining room but we also have the creamery and Customers gonna to respond to delicious. Delicious has no stars. It has a, a, has a response that goes from your heart to your gut 
to your mind and you want to be part of something. So we're going to, you know, focus on creamery, focus on a take that, do it in a, in a multi-layered way. Maybe there's some music, maybe there is a playlist. You know, we're going to do it so people want to be part of our brand, take part of our brand. Um, and I think as chefs before, we always knew how to multitask because we had to. This is going to set us up to a new mm-hmm. level of multitasking and technology is going to be key. But trust me, if it's not delicious and if it's not connecting to an audience, it doesn't matter what technology you have. It's still the most important thing is to make delicious food. Quote of the day. <laughs> preach, preach. <laughs> Um, Kwame, I want to um, I want to jump off that and ask another question, which comes from um, Curian, which I think you guys have all referenced. But um, can you guys be profitable at fifty percent occupancy? And is the answer to that by doing things like selling condiments, like Moonland talked about, or having a creamery, like Marcus is now opening in Miami? I think um, that's a great Kwame. question. You're gonna have to sacrifice a lot if you want to be profitable um and that may be sacrificing bringing back certain staff you know um you know my restaurant is 70 has 70 plus employees and if we were to bring them all back at 50 percent capacity no we wouldn't be profitable um if we don't bring them all back then maybe we stand a chance but even at that it's it's very very difficult so getting creative and coming out of your comfort zone and like you know chef marcus said connectivity and serving delicious food and drink. Um, my restaurant is a restaurant that I never wanted to do takeout at, but it's something that we have to really think about now. Um, and you know, the thought process behind that is that, oh, I'm this refined restaurant, you know, I, I can't put hospitality in a box, you know, Karen said that. And, um, but you have to realize that fine dining is relative. You know, Olive Garden is fine dining to certain people. My restaurant is, Danielle's restaurant to certain people, you know? Um, But at the end of the day, we have to connect with them and find out how to get our food to them. So for us, we've um, made our food into indicative of Caribbean takeout restaurants. So it's it's kind of like a Caribbean meat and three. You know, you get your, your protein, you get your three vegetables, you maybe get a mango chutney on the side and that's it. And it's also to help streamline our um, process in the kitchen because I don't want to be putting this stress on everybody creating these perfect little dishes, you know, with microgreens or whatever, or perfect knife cuts Mm -hmm. um, when they also have things going on at home, you know, and we really need to think about that. It's all encompassing, you know, there's no front of the house, back of the house. It's a dining room kitchen. It's one home. And uh, we need to make sure we're thinking about that moving forward. Caribbean meat and three. Do you take order now, Kwame? Because that sounds delicious. I'm like seeing right now. Sign me up. I'll pay for shipping. <laughs> in order in fact, right here. In fact, that's a, a question that I just came up to me now. Is there anything that uh, that you have all created in this three, four month period that you haven't ever uh, presented to anyone before? And now you say we're going to keep this on the menu forever. Uh, uh, Moonlin? Yeah, there's been, um, you know, everyone, when everyone's running to the markets and hoarding rice and all that, we're like, what can we make that isn't perishable right away? What can people take home, still feel comforted, taste, like have a taste of Malaysia? And we came up with the Kaya toast kit, which is like a loaf of bread, the Kaya jam, butter, the nasi lemak kit, the dried (laughs) rice, coconut. So it's a lot of thinking. I'm like, oh, I'm just going to kit everything. We're going to have a coffee kit, this kit, this kit, this kit. Um, (laughs) So just getting really creative and having fun. Yes, kit everything. It's using what you already have and being aware of every ingredient having multi like they're multi-purposeful, right? So just being, getting deeper into what you usually sell, but then expand that way. So it's been, you know, honestly, that part has been really fun. It's, um, I'm usually doing the day-to-day operations, but I love the creativity side and I feel like the past two years has been more focused on restaurant operations. So now I get to sit back and really just think what can we do outside the box? What can we do for the community and for the people who are excited for the Kopi Tiam food, but can't make it over here, pick it up. How do we ship it? So it's been fun. Uh, anyone else want to have anything that inspired them in the last couple of months? 
Well, no, no. I mean, for me, for example, we were doing, uh, uh, in my restaurant, we were doing a beef duo for years and years, and I didn't want to see the beef duo anymore. And since uh, we are doing the takeout with Daniel Bury Kitchen, uh, it was an opportunity to bring back this kind of homey and, and rustic dishes of the great short ribs in red wine and, and the sirloin and the mashed potato and, and things where um, it's complicated to do it at home, but it's delicious to receive it and have it in your home. So, um, you know, a dish that was kind of out of the menu for quite a while came back and is the hit. Wow, I'm getting very hungry just listening to all of these things. I'm drooling. <laughs> uh, we started, we're going to launch a, a dish that we call, um, it's really a bird dog that comes out of our fried chicken, but it's really a blend between a hot dog and a bird uh, chicken. So I think that a couple of things, like for me, it's about connecting with an audience. So we're going to start a, a podcast called This Moment that I'm launching next week that really takes us through uh, this moment. Um, and then, so that's on the narrative side. And then on the, uh, on the food side in, in, in Overtown, like starting this crispy dog, because we have to really think about people might come in the car and just sit at the parking lot, or we have a lot of patio and outdoor space. How can people eat it? Um, you know, hold it up, eat it, and then maybe, you know, hang out a little bit, social distancing. So what I know is that chefs constantly have to think out of the box and we will keep, even if it's a challenging time, I know that chef's going to come up with amazing food. I really have a lot of faith in our community. Uh, Kwame, I know you kicked this off with uh, with your description, but is there anything that you, you want to add? Yeah, I mean, it really, my thought process with creating the new dishes for the menu is really streamlining streamlining things in the kitchen. We have to be prepared for a lot of people not to come back. Um, so like whatever I can do to make things um, as equally as delicious, but very, very um, labor effective, uh, it also dictates how the menu is, is being put together. So that's how that Caribbean meat and three came together, you know, I was like, oh, I can make a lot of, you know, curry chicken and rice and peas and, you know, uh, beer braised cabbage. And when the guests order it, we can put it together. It'll look really nice on the plate. But um, as far as the preparation goes, I can do it with one or two people. And that's the way it, it needs to go. As, as opposed to before, it was like, you know, each cook has only three dishes. Now it's like each cook has like the whole menu essentially, and and then we can plug and play that way. So I think um, reducing the the stress uh, of the labor is something that's really really important moving forward because there's so many outside stressors these days. Whether you're thinking about the you know the killings of you know black and brown people or the pandemic you know or the protests or the riots at late night there's like so many things that are going on i think it would um behoove me not to really think that through and um, apply that all of those outside um stressors to my menu and the way that my staff puts it together okay to you that point and this Sorry, Marcus, you would talk about this in your in your opening thing, but at this big moment where so much change is happening on like Black Lives Matter and has to be permeating through Washington, how do you see how can we make the dining scene more equitable? Like is can we like start a can we start restaurant centers in places like Newark and the Bronx? You know, can we move like what can I would love to hear ways that we can all work towards making yeah. making this more equitable, you know, because so many people have been left out of this process. Sure. Mark, well, I, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, well, it's a longer conversation, but I would say, first of all, America has a great history and inspiring black women like Pigfoot Mary and, or Miss Leah Chase that was really at the cornerstone between integration and fantastic food, right? So there is a lot of inspiration to draw from majority African-American women and also immigrants coming to this country and 
setting up, I mean, if you go back and look at the history of Chinatowns in this country and the, the laws that were, were created, it's really horrible. So it's not bad to think about American history and food, but chefs from all cornerstones have come together and overcome that. So we actually have done, um, we have some history to draw from, but I think this era of what a great restaurant has to be, the zip code for me, it's gone. You can open. I mean, we open in Overtown. We have restaurants in Newark. Uh, it's about creating opportunities for uh, and make more equitable kitchen. And we have a long way to go, but I know the conversation um, is there right now. Uh, yeah. Kwame was part of a panel that we did with uh, IRC, Independent Restaurant Coalition, last week, where uh, we were 10 African-American chefs and talked about just because we're black, we're not monolithic. We have very different starting points. We share something, but we are very different. And it was about 400 people that uh, was part of that process. So I think that learning about the past, seeing what you can do as a chef in terms of creating a culture of inclusiveness, um, and then hopefully inspire others to open affordable and great restaurants of all levels, um, without a zip code in mind is really the key. Uh, and because of today's age with Instagram, social media and so on, you can connect in so many different ways. I think what we consider a restaurant, it's gonna be very different over the next 10 years. We learned that with the food trucks uh, and we, 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 we are really learning that with things like Insta, uh, with Gold Belly, for example. And I think we're just in the beginning of those kitchen and so on. So, so it's an inspiring time and it's a challenging time at the same time. Uh, I think, was anyone gonna, uh, Daniel? No, Kate, you were mentioning also that good restaurant in neighborhood like Harlem or the Bronx uh, could have more, of, uh, I mean, there's more opportunity for a restaurant. I think Marcus, you have been an, doing an amazing job in Harlem with, uh, with not only uh, being the lighting rod for other restaurateurs to be able to up but they are supporting them also in doing so. And um, I mean, my best moment with my team was uh, I have I happen to have quite a lot of uh, um, African Francophile or French African, I would say, from either Senegal or, or, or Mali, and 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 they. Uh, and their friends, their wife, have restaurants in Harlem uh, of the team. So we will go after work and eat Senegalese food in Harlem. And, and it's, it's like those moments, um, you know, we share them with the team. Everybody is there of the restaurant. But is you want, we want more of those moments than every community. We help them rise their cuisine to... Uh, to a level where they have not only a local neighborhood recognition, but more of a city recognition as well. So it's important yeah. to, go, to move around the city to support people because they're not going to get funding to start these restaurants from the government, right? So they will have no, everyone has to it has to be done intelligently and, and purposely also because not everyone will afford to have a fancy chef cooking there. But I think there is possibility to use the local community and to also create something who is really meaningful for them and, and you know, do a cuisine also who I think connect as well. It's important. Yeah, um, it's, it's extremely important to invest in communities that don't look like yours. You know, um, there is, yeah. first of all, there, there's a um, responsibility to look within yourself on the things that you can change and investing doesn't just mean dollars, you know, yeah. it, it can mean supporting these different communities, you know, and I think back to, you know, Chef Marcus, when he came to Harlem, I was a kid in Harlem at that time. And I never was able to see a, a African American chef really doing it, you know, and I would go, he doesn't even know this, but I would go to Red Rooster in the morning and get one of the biscuits and sit there and just watch him talk to his staff. And I was like, one day I can become that because I can see that. Right. So like we need to invest in these communities and come out of our comfort zone. Um, it's, it's extremely important. And then doing the research on things that are sometimes deemed uncomfortable, 
a lot of industries in America profited off of slavery, including the restaurant industry. And that's what the basis is, basis of it was. And that's also why it's so hard to turn a profit and we're scrambling trying to figure it out. The only way it used to happen is because there was a lot of free labor going on. So the, that's how tipping started and things like that. And we need to really think of the core of our industries. It's, it's not just the food industry. If we want to create an equitable platform um, for all of America and really embody what freedom is. That's very interesting. I had, yeah. I just yeah. now put together that connection between tipping and, and, and free labor. That's, that's fascinating. Uh, in Learned fact, that so was a question that someone asked and I, I just sort of popped it up now. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah. And uh, I think also really investing in your own community too, it's helpful because you are, it starts, no one is going to look after your own community more than you and yourself. Like for example, Kopi Tian being in the borderline of Chinatown and the Lower East Side, we're very privileged. Kopi Tian, you know, honestly is very privileged where we have amazing community that comes through, but Chinatown itself is always the first community hit and the last to get back on its feet, you know, 9-11, now the pandemic, Chinatown was closing. The sales were dropping 70 to 80% even before COVID was declared a pandemic in the States. So much racism and xenophobia instantaneously going through that community. And these restaurants were multi-generational through the families where a lot of them don't speak English. They're not able to get on social media. So it's also a responsibility if you're able and at an age to be able to give back to your own community location wise also to do so and take that responsibility to make sure everyone is able to stand up together. Yep. Uh, okay, do you have a question? If not, I'll ask one. Um, go ahead. Oh. Well, apart from working for Business Week, I used to work for a uh, People magazine. So I'm gonna ask a People <laughs> magazine question. Uh, all of you have, uh, being in the restaurant business, as all of you have been saying, requires a lot of creativity. And it's, it, uh, even for small uh, people who have just started out, like Kwame and and Wunden, they've already had several lives in the restaurant business. Uh, uh, what story in your, and we all, we all know that this is one of the most unprecedented times in human history. Uh, so what story in your past, that, what, difficult, what difficulty that you have overcome helps you through this today? I mean, it can be a very personal story. It could be someone that you remember who, work, who inspires you. I mean, it's a sort of, as I said, it's a People Magazine story. So. Be as a, be as a, as 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 as, as saccharine as you want. Um, well, then you, oh, Kwame. Uh, well, I think for me, um, what's helped me get to this point in time is failure. You know, and being comfortable in that space. Um, you know, I opened a restaurant early in my career that lasted, you know, twelve weeks. It was a two million dollar project, and I was, you know, catapulted into this food industry through that. And um, the restaurant failed and I was able to really um, take the time to reflect and see what I needed to work on and then push through and continue to open up some restaurants. So I think failure has made me a little bit comfortable in this space, but I wouldn't say that I'm very comfortable. I think this is something that I, I can't really um, compare this to any other Thing that's ever happened to me before you know and i try to take it as what it is you know that i'm going to be mourning my past life you know um i have to be comfortable within the unknown um and that's what happened within failure and i also have to understand that things will get better and we will get out of this and will continue to thrive but the thing that's probably helped me the most is mentorship is being able to call people within this industry you know like Chef Marcus, you know, I could speak to Kate and, you know, talk about my insecurities and be very, very honest and be vulnerable. And um, that's helped me the most getting through this time period. I don't know if I could have made it through without it. That's wonderful. Kate, you're a hero. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm seconding. So much. Yeah. 
I'm second in economy. Um, I grew up in the restaurant industry. My parents owned restaurants growing up, and I never wanted to get into the industry because I saw the way my father ran it, and he was very abusive mentally and physically. So growing up, I was like, no, that's all I associated with running a restaurant. As I got older, I realized you can run it out of passion and you can run it out of love. So mentorship has been through and through something very important to me and any restaurant projects I work on. Um, a really big turning point was also the SARS epidemic of a little over a decade ago. I was in high school at that time and all these friends, I thought, you know, they were always so excited. Let's go to your dad's restaurant. Let's go to your restaurant and eat. All of a sudden they're like, oh, don't get close to that one. Or sitting at their restaurants and watching people come in and actually asking the manager, if I eat here, am I going to get SARS? As a child, that was so devastating. And so now being in my mid thirties and having a platform to combat that it's, I think that's been why this has been so, so important to me to really speak out and show that you don't get COVID by dining at an Asian restaurant. You're, you're not going to get it from hanging out or talking to people like us. So just battling a lot of, um, nah, yeah. So. Yeah, for me, yeah, for me, it's really, I would say a couple of things, but mentorship is so important. It's one of the best things that we have in our industry. Um, you know, just as hopefully I can guide and be there for Kwame, you know, Danielle is always there for me, always. Whether when Charlie Trotter died, was a big mentor to me. First person I call is Danielle. Um, when Floyd Cardos, you know, it was just, it just really, it really sat me. I mean, I get choked up even thinking about Floyd. I call Danielle. So we, we have our mentorship and it goes cross races, cross gender. Uh, Miss Leah Chase was a huge, huge mentor for me. And so I think having the mentorship and being there for the younger uh, chefs and cooks coming up is super, super important. And I think about that, um, what is my role in that a lot? So the locations we pick are not uh, by accident, but really with that in mind. And also the work that we put out, right? Um, I think we all come from different backgrounds, but I think in this moment it's helped me a lot, the blessings of being a black man and the blessing of being an immigrant. It guided me and prepared me for all these different things that are being told about us right now but I remember coming here as an immigrant. I remember my parents' conversation of what can happen to you as a black man. And I draw from that and I tell that to my son, Zion, today. This is very real, right? Yesterday in the park that Zion and I lived and worked and play every day, somebody hung up a noose, a noose, right? So we can do hanging in your park, right? This is real, what oh, happening oh my God. And to be a chef, and to be a parent in this environment, you know, you have to be so strong because there's so many outside forces. So I am lucky that I have the hospitality community. So I owe constantly, I think about the work and worth. So, you know, I put it, you know, this fall we're putting, a book is coming out that we did called The Ride. It documents 40 of the most influential African-American chefs in this country. Some of them very well known like Kwame, and some are not known. And it's gonna work as a connector so chefs around the country can say, hey, my next pop-up should be done by, with Mashama Bailey, or my next pop-up gonna done, be done by Naisha Erickson. So it's a connector. So I draw from that lineage of both being an immigrant and being a black man. And I can't tell you how much that it impacted me that where we play with my son in this day and age in America, there's a news and hangings are real. There's been five hanging, lynching, uh, since George Floyd, two in California, one in Seattle. This is happening in the most advanced country in the world. It's completely unacceptable. It's horrendous. Uh, we have a couple of minutes. We have one minute left. So, uh, uh, Daniel, do you want to say something quickly? And then Kate and I can wrap up. No, uh, I want to say, you know, I uh, maybe more than uh, everyone uh, here, I was here during 9-11 and we were shaken, but we didn't collapse. Uh, this time, it feels like everything we build over the years, our life, uh, the pyramid we built for ourselves, for our business, for our staff, for everyone, all collapsed. And 
the first things we right away, um, the first thing I worry right away was the staff. How can we at least the fiber of those pyramids? How can we connect them again and protect them and help them? And and uh, I think we are learning that you know there's there's a lot we have to do to build back our pyramids, but. Uh, and it's not only money. I think there's a lot of other things we have to work on. And I am, I am optimistic, and I am happy that we may be able to bring opportunity and make some change as well. Uh, okay, you want to start, Marcus? Did you? Can I just ask, Marcus? Did you say that was a book? That was a book that's coming out. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yep, yep. The rise is coming, and it's going to be a platform. Um, yeah, in October it's coming out, but it's going to be a platform also. I'm going to cre we're going to create a residency for one African American chef every year, so they can go away, just the way artists residency. Because I realize as chefs, we never take time out to reflect and 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 recharge. So uh, the process of the book is going to go to this residency, so that young individuals can reflect, study, and upload and recharge. Because you know uh, if I'm very privileged, and I have the opportunity to do this. That's going to be that's our, that's my work, and that's my task. Well, thank you, Marcus, for doing that's that. Awesome. That's super cool. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I can't thank you enough. I wish this conversation was five hours longer because I want each of you. <laughs> I want to hear more from each of you. But for right now, I just want to say thank you, thank you so much, Moonlin Sai, Kwame, Kwame Antwabi. Marcus Samuelson and Daniel Blute. I get choked up when I see Kwame because I feel like I feel like he forgot to grow up with. I, were, I got to watch him grow up, I should say. And, and, and last thank you guys. Chicago, last year in Chicago, Kwame, you were amazing on stage. That was really special. Yes. Thank you. I, uh, thank you. I appreciate it. Everything. Every time you speak, it's amazing. Well, they serve. I, I want to second thank you. Very much. Uh, this would go on for several more hours, but I think I would rather have dinner individually with all of this, all of you. So I'm hoping for that day to mm -hmm. come back. Uh, yeah. And to wrap up, uh, you can follow Bloomberg Business Week on Twitter at, uh, at BW and visit Bloomberg.com uh, Business Week for our latest issue, which includes a special food section and an essay about how to how I survive how I survive. Uh, in, during the lockdown, since I don't cook. Anyway, thank you all very, very much for your time. Thank you, of course. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Bye. 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 B